so now I have this like a pinwheel of of what my revenue streams look like. So in the center of it is piano lessons. And then there's, you know, there's judging, there's accompanying, there's my book, there are workshops and consulting, um, different avenues like that. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. G'day, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, where I have a great chat with other inspirational music educators from around the world. This is episode number 94 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. And if you're one of my Inner Circle members, then a special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, and I'm the host of this great podcast, the place where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, and teaching strategies to help you be the best teacher that you can be. Today's show notes and a full transcript to download are available at timtopham.com slash episode 94. Quick couple of reminders before we start. Next month, which is July, if you're listening to this when it goes live, is Piano Teacher Conference Month around the world. So if you're in Australia, then I'll be heading over to the APPC in Adelaide. That's the 10th to the 14th of July. You'll be able to find out details about that online. And I'm organizing some drinks and a bit of a meetup in conjunction with Hal Leonard over here. So to find out about that and where you can come to hang out with me and some of the other great teachers who listen to this podcast, you can head to timtopham.com slash meetup. And if you're over in the States, then make sure you come to my NCKP workshop on chords, harmony, and composing. It's going to be great fun. That conference is in Chicago from the 26th to the 29th of July. Tickets are at keyboardpedagogy.org. And Thursday night drinks, that's going to be at DOC Wine Bar. I'm going to be organizing, again, another catch-up to meet as many people as possible. And the details of that, again, are at timtopham.com slash meetup. Today's podcast is all about business, specifically how one piano teacher was able to make $100,000 in their first year of teaching. Is it really possible? How did she do it? We're going to dive in and find out all about it today. And we've got one very special freebie download for you today. In fact, it's two. One of the biggest challenges of owning and running a successful business today is standing out from the crowd. Many of us teach in places with big competition from teachers charging sometimes tiny amounts for lessons. The only way to get ahead is to know what sets you apart and promote it. So today, as part of our podcast, we're giving you a freebie that is two cheat sheets in one. It's a brand development question sheet to get you thinking and a brand development worksheet to help you implement some changes in your studio. They're going to help you work out exactly what it is that makes you, you, and how you can make sure other people know it too. You'll be able to grab that at timtopham.com slash episode 94. My guest today is actually a repeat guest. She was last on the podcast back in episode 12. That's a good two years ago. In her mid-twenties, my guest began a teaching path that was inspired by the traditional but propelled by the creative and familiar. She began trying to solve the puzzle of how to keep students interested in making music and had a goal of keeping them involved in live music throughout their lifetime. And that led her to half of her work focusing on popular music styles. Through almost a decade of research and hundreds of students, she has achieved a formula for success not only for her students but also herself. She emphasizes joy, creativity, and perseverance with long-term goals that focus on each person being a collection of strengths. She holds an MM in Piano Performance and Pedagogy and NCTM certification, and she became a certified teacher with the Royal Conservatory in 2016. Welcome back to the podcast, Kristen Yost. Hey, Tim. It is great to be back. (laughs) And you've also got a friend on the couch with you. Uh, who's, (laughs) Who's this that you're patting? This is Elle. Oh, very, Elle, very cute. My, she's my 12-year-old Cocker Spaniel. She's, she's having a tough time, but we're, we're taking it one day at a time. Oh, she looks absolutely adorable. <laughs> Great. She can keep you warm she, on the couch. She, <laughs> she is. Yes, she is. <laughs> Well, look, uh, as I said, it's great to have you back on the show. Last time you were on, we were talking all about reinventing your recitals. So 
Uh, and in actual fact, you gave me the idea to try out my own pop showcase. I don't know if I've told you this, uh, but after oh, that episode, wonderful. you gave us all these great oh, tips. Good. So I tried it with my kids, totally loved it. It was very, very simple, kept it really simple, but just got the band together, had my kids playing pop. So thank you to you for that great idea. It's a rocking idea. Wonderful. I'm glad. I'm glad you did it. So we've been talking business all this month on the blog, and I wanted to chat with you about a book that you wrote called How I Made $100,000 My First Year as a Piano Teacher, which I think I believe started as a conference presentation originally. So the first question I've got to ask you, did you really make $100,000? I really made $100,000 my first year as a full-time independent teacher. Um, I know it sounds crazy, but I did. Um, it's this it's this sort of magical uh, formula that that I was in the right place at the right time with the right credentials, the right personality. and uh, that's what people were looking for. So um, I did a lot of demographic research before I moved, before i I got my house. I looked at where educated people were because, I have a master's degree, and so I knew I would be needing to be in a community that valued higher education. They valued, you know, they valued quality. Um, they didn't just want daycare lessons for their kids. They, uh, I wanted to be in a community that had a high education level, where where parents are high achieving. So they have expectations of their children, which I do too. And all signs pointed to about a half hour north of where I was doing my, my graduate degree. And I looked at the Chamber of Commerce website. I looked at the census.gov site that we have here in the United States. And all the signs pointed to, to Frisco. And, and interestingly enough, we had like five anchor stores in the mall. So you know that the economy is good when you have the big anchor stores. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but in the United States, Whole Foods, it's kind of like this fancy schmancy grocery store that they actually don't look at how much people earn when they, when they open up a location. It's actually their education level that they're looking for. They want educated people who do research on their food. So I wanted to be in a, in a place where people did research on piano lessons. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, you've actually caught me off guard because I wasn't expecting you to say any of what you've just said. This is, this is really <laughs> making me think this is good. So it sounds like you actually decided where, not just to set up your studio, but where to live and base yourself based on where you felt you could be most successful as a teacher. Is that right? Yes. That's exactly wow. right. Okay. Now, and that's something that not a lot of people would do. And of course, many people kind of fall into the job of being a piano teacher. And so they just start from home wherever they're living. And mm -hmm. do you think it's possible for those teachers who are already based somewhere and who perhaps have children, they can't just up and leave and go to somewhere where the education level is higher. Is it possible for them to have the kind of success that you've been able to achieve? The short answer is it depends, <laughs> um, and and that really does depend on a lot of different factors. You have to look at median household income. Um, you have to look at market saturation. Well, our market's very saturated where I am now. It wasn't when I moved, but it is now, and and earning potential. So there are in in value systems. If you're going to be living in rural South Dakota, no. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be living in an urban area outside of Denver. Uh, suburban area outside of Denver, very probable. Right. Okay. And we'll go into more depth because there's obviously uh, more detail than just you chose the right area. You obviously did a lot right in your teaching. So can you tell us what your studio looked like when you first set it up? And I don't mean the look necessarily, but how many students and one-on-one -on -one teaching, was it groups, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So uh, it was in my house. It was in my living room and I had I had a terrible uh, grand. Uh, grand piano shaped object that uh, <laughs> it, it just, it was, it really was awful. And I met this wonderful piano technician, wonderful human being, wonderful technician. And he like knew right from the start that this was just a piano shaped object. And, um, and so he helped me find a really nice, nice instrument. And it was just in my, again, just in my living room, I had a nice little fireplace. I still have, I mean, I, I actually still live in the same house. And people would come to, to my home and it was all private lessons. 
Right. So all one-on-one, uh, did you start teaching with the grand piano-shaped shelf or did yeah, you? I did. You, you did? Okay. I did. You know, there needs to be some sort of education for all pianists on how to buy an instrument, what to look for. You know, it's this unrealistic setting that we, that we go, you know, we grow through when we're in the university system where we all have Steinway pianos to practice on and they're magically maintained and they just magically appear um, in tune for us. And, it, and, it, and if they're not, then all we have to do is tell someone and then they magically tune them and fix them and do everything and, and come to find out, well, that cost of magic, is actually $120,000 and then you have to maintain it. So, um, I didn't know any better and it was a very expensive mistake, but I learned it very early on. And I'm just, I'm thankful that I got out of it. Interestingly enough, when I started studying for my diploma, uh, my teacher, who is a very, very well-known Australian pianist, an incredibly talented teacher and pianist, she had the most funny old clapped-out piano. It was out of tune. It was <laughs> horrid to play. But I watched her play it, demonstrating something to me, and it actually sounded, I don't know how she did it. It was magic. It sounded, <laughs> it sounded pretty good, right? Uh, but I always, I, I learned a lot from that experience in that, you know what, it, it's actually a good experience for students to sometimes play on dodgy instruments too because we have to do it right well that's it's funny you should mention that when I was uh, an undergraduate with Rick Andrews at Augustana College um, I was getting ready for a state competition and he told me he said if you can go into the basement of our of our uh, college you find the worst piano in the middle of the night and if you can play your program at half tempo you know you're ready (laughs) uh you know you're ready to win. I think it's. Like, I actually ended up winning it, and uh, and he was right. You find the worst piano to run your program on, and if you can make music that way, uh, you know there's something special there. Mm. All right. So you've, you you did you did all your research. You decided to live where you felt you could make a good income as a teacher, and you set up as a one-on-one teacher, as most of us are, uh, inside your house. How many students did you have at the beginning? Too many. Too many. So, okay. So, too many. <laughs> so, really, too many. How did you find those students originally? Because it sounds like you just moved there and set up shop and you had too many students. I did. Uh, it really was. It really was a little bit magical. I mean, everything I thought was going to happen actually happened. Um, and, and then some. So, I, I created a website. Um, this was in my. In my final semester of my master's degree, uh, one of our projects was to create studio materials. And I just was really excited by that idea. And I didn't have any role models. Um, Everybody I knew, they were university professors, which is fantastic, but I really have no desire to do that. And so I just kind of had to figure it out on my own. So I knew I needed a website. I knew I needed a couple, a couple of things. And I actually started getting involved in the community uh, remotely. I mean, granted, it's, it's about a half hour uh, without traffic from where I was living at the time, but, but I wasn't traveling to Frisco. I mean, I hadn't even been to Frisco when I decided that this is where I was going to be. And uh, I started through my website because nobody had a website at that time. This is 2005, I guess, 2006, somewhere in there. It was 2006. I got my website in 2005 and I paid a couple hundred dollars for somebody to build it for me. And I, I found this online community forum, not Facebook, but a different community forum. And between my website and the rapid fire of uh, word of mouth in a community that was not saturated. Uh, it it was I couldn't handle <laughs> all of the students that were coming my way. It just goes to show how important an online presence is too, and this goes for today as much as any other time. Uh, and in actual fact, next week's episode on the podcast, we're diving right into how to build a website on WordPress from scratch. All right. So one of the things we talked about just before you started was was mindset. And it sounded like you've uh, experienced a lot of teachers in the past who you might have worked with or presented to that have maybe not the right mindset to actually achieve these kind of outcomes in their studio. Can you talk just about that briefly? Um, Sure. I aim to be growth-minded in my life and in particular in in myself as a teaching artist and for my students. 
That comes from a lot of the books that I read. And Carol Dweck wrote a book called Mindset. Um, and it's about growth versus fixed. And I think a lot of times musicians, classically trained musicians in particular, um, pianists, who of course I'm, I'm one of them, <laughs> um, we tend to, at least how I was trained by a couple of teachers, not for the good, but they were very fixed in their approach. Oh, well, so-and-so can't play her way out of a paper bag or, you know, they just say really terrible things about these, these children. And, and the most important thing you can be to a young child is positive, encouraging, nurturing, calming, and pleasant. And this, you know, this, in, this individual in particular I'm thinking about just isn't. <laughs> um, and, and so there's just this, they cut their potential off before they've even had an opportunity to try to reach it. And so much of how we do things is communication, right? So just because we may be saying something in one way doesn't mean that they're not receiving it or because we're not saying it in a way that they're ready to receive it or at the time that they're ready to receive it doesn't mean that they are not going to be great musicians um, at some point in their lives or that, or that they're not enjoying something. So um, I think it's really important for me to be around teachers, to be around colleagues who see potential and to, who see where other human beings can grow. And with that, we can all flourish and thrive. But without that basic understanding of growth, you know, I've lied, outright lied to some of my students and, and just said, wow, you really are just so quick at this. And, you know, they're getting part of it, but not all of it. But they sit up a little bit straighter and they go home and they practice more because they're living up to the idea that I've projected on them of who they are. And that works on, in both ways. Mm. I sometimes have the internal uh, dialogue with myself about whether I'm being too positive for students who actually need to be told what's real or whether, you know, and the tough love kind of thing, or whether actually it's all about positivity. Do you, do you ever struggle with that sometimes to know that sometimes you actually, you've, tough love is good? Oh, absolutely. I am not falsely positive other than when it comes to praising effort, because I don't want to place a value on them as a human being, but I will place value on their efforts, not the outcome. Yes. I think for, for, young, for young children, acquiring skills, I think it's integral to their success. Uh, not all children are born gritty, where they have a lot of internal perseverance. Uh, that can grow, depending on their home situation, too, um, and how they, how they perform in academic situations. Um, there are a lot of different factors. I actually just I had a student on last week sometime. And he was just complaining about everything. He was complaining about life. He was complaining about this, that, and the other thing. Well, I'll come to find out he's really upset because his favorite teacher is leaving. Mm. So it wasn't that it wasn't that, you know, he has a, a terrible attitude about everything, but he was he was manifesting these these frustrations in ways that he didn't know how to deal with. And so, I mean, I could have I and I talked to him about what he was putting out into the world and how, you know, Gabby, this could be, this could be considered toxic. You know, what good things did you learn from your teacher? And so then we focus and we turn it around because our narrative that we're using inside our head is really important. Mm. And if it's always negative, that's not a good thing, but knowing how to make um, something I, I, I say fail forward. How are you going to fail forward? <laughs> fail, own it, and move forward. <laughs> How are you going to move past what you just did and not replicate that failure? I like it. So you, uh, you've, you've built this studio. You've, you happen to have got this magical full studio very, very quickly. You're teaching one-on-one. -on -one. You're obviously charging a reasonable amount. Were you doing mm -hmm. things on the side to make extra income or did you literally uh, make the 100000 from piano teaching one-on-one? -on -one? It, it was all from teaching. Uh, I don't do that now, and I and I actually I highly discourage simply having one revenue stream in your life, especially as an artist. Um, but when you're working on your craft, it's perfectly fine. You know, you have to be really good at something. So now I have this like a pinwheel 
of of what my revenue streams look like. So in the center of it is piano lessons. And then there's, you know, there's judging, there's accompanying, there's my book, there are workshops and consulting, um, different avenues like that. But there could be, if I wanted to arrange music um, and put it out there or compose, that could be another offshoot for, you know, for others who have that interest. There's no doubt that, yeah, diversifying the income and getting it from lots of different places can be a great benefit for anyone in this industry. And there's that great book too, which you were featured in, um, David Cutler's The Savvy Music Teacher, which mm. if for anyone who's looking at trying to work out other ways of making income, this is the Bible for that. Great book, yeah. highly recommended. Uh, David was on the show uh, probably last year, I think. And yeah, he's just got so many great ideas, summer camps, you know, online courses, downloads, lesson plans, you name it, they're all in mm-hmm. there. And you were mentioned, yeah. which I thought was great. Um, so what does your studio look like today? You've kind of given us a little bit of an idea, but you've kind of gone boom and you've got something pretty big now, mm-hmm. right? Tell us quickly yeah, we have a, Sure. I have a school. And if you want to see, we actually have virtual photos on our Facebook page, um, at the Center for Musical Minds in Frisco, Texas. And we have five teaching spaces where we have two Steinway, three Steinways, a Busendorfer and a Kauai, and then and a guitar teaching space. So, I mean, we're in it. What people don't understand, what, what a lot of academics don't understand is you can teach popular music on a high level. And it doesn't mean that you don't have an interest in a love for classical music done well. So um, I'm adamant that lessons happen on really great quality instruments. Um, and I'm fortunate to, to know how to find them. <laughs> now, I assume you didn't go straight from I'm teaching at home and doing very well out of it to I've now got three Steinways and a Bosendorfer and staff and all that. So at what point did you think, you know what, I think I can actually build a school out of it? I'm of the mindset that when you have a big idea, you need to have a lot of small steps planned out. And, And this all came about... I, in, really in my first year, I thought, this is insane. Um, I can't, I, first of all, I can't do this for an extended period of time. Um, the second one-on-one of all, teaching, you mean? Well, the, I had like 70 some students and I can't, I can't do this. Now, granted at that time, they were mostly half hour lessons. So it's a little bit more manageable, but it's still mm, exhausting. It, it was a lot. It was exhausting because mm. you're, you're constantly putting things out. And I had a lot of ideas that, that I was not able to put out that I had in graduate school, but I finally had my own little laboratory to conduct my own experiments. So it evolved in, and I wanted to, Sam Holland, I had a, a great, we actually, drew up what we wanted the school to be like. So philosophically, what does that look like? And what does that look like in practice? And, you know, here we are, it's 2006 or seven, or I think it was 2007 at the time, because we opened the school up in 2008. And what does that mean to a community at this point? What do we want to put out into the world? And that was a lot of fun. Mm. How did you meet Sam and decide you were going to work with him? So I met Sam. I came here to do my master's degree with him and Alfred Molyneux. And I was telling him about my ideas. And he said, well, Kristen, this sounds like something I'd love to be a part of. And so that's how it all happened. Now he's the dean at at SMU or for in Meadows. I was going to say, well, you know, that's, you know, what (laughs) having Sam work with you and say that about your work must have just been brilliant because, you know, what a, what a, what a teacher to have involved. You know, the, my favorite thing about Sam Holland is he never tells you how to think and he never mm. tells you what to think. And he, he is the main reason I teach the way I do, I think, at this point is because it's, not, it's about the big idea and it's about helping other people realize their potential and showing them how, how to grow in different ways um, and be their best selves. It's not about training a a pet. It's not about training a human being to be exactly like you in the same way with the same mechanics, because we don't all have the same everything. So Mm. that's where the artistry comes in, which I actually, I love, I thrive in that. And you can see that comes through in all your videos uh, on your website and things, that passion, the love for students, the 
the yeah. you know, the artistry. You know, it's just it's it's great for anyone who's interested in what um, Kristen does and what the teaching looks like. Heading to that uh, her website, which we'll put in the show notes, uh, is a great uh, great way to get a view of what she's up to. I, I was just I was picturing there's there's got to be a point. So you, you've got together with Sam, you're planning these great ideas. There's a point where I'm picturing Indiana Jones, right? In um, in that uh, in the wow, what was the one? The can he's in the Canyon of the Crescent Moon, and he's got to do like duck under this, and the ball roll <laughs> ball rolls through here, and he goes and he's getting the cup, right? The um, the cup of good and evil, or whatever they call it. Anyway, at one point he he gets to this chasm, absolute pitch uh-huh. blackness below. And he has to trust that there's a path there that he can't see, and he has to kind of just put mm. a foot out and step, <laughs> and then he lands on the path. So you had to do this at some stage and just go because it it costs money. Obviously, you've got to hire a bigger venue, you've got mm. to eventually hire some staff, you've got to perhaps buy some new instruments. That's a mm-hmm. big leap. So for teachers who are listening, who might be thinking about this, how do they get past that that block of wow, am I really going to do this and how do I make sure I get it right? Well, I I think that there are a lot of people who think that they want to do it, but they don't really want to do it. So you have to be, be inspired by the possibility of the impact that you can make in your community. If that doesn't inspire you, I don't see it lasting long term. I, I mean, I see time and time again how those types of places don't last. So you have to have a love of solving puzzles, all kinds of puzzles, financial puzzles, uh, personnel puzzles, uh, student puzzles. You have to have strong communication skills. You have to have a lot of patience and you have to have a five-year plan. You have to have a three-year plan. You have to have a two-year plan. You have to have a one-year plan. And whatever you plan for as far as expenses, add 20% for contingency. <laughs> um, really take 10, 20% off of where you think your your best growth strategy is. Brain it in. Be really conservative. And realize that you're going to have to work a lot of hours for years three years, four years, five years. And um, it is not for the faint of heart, but when your long view wants to impact the community in a really positive way, then I think it's absolutely possible. Mm. I, I like that you've made it clear. If this is just a way you think you can make more money by teaching, mm-hmm. then that's not the right way to go about it because it won't yeah, last, because- right? It won't. And typically teachers are teachers at heart, um, which is why you see a lot of business people who own the Cracker Box music schools, which we sometimes, you know, make fun of. Um, They have a formula. What we lack sometimes as artists is a process for how to do things. And the processes are what make the corporations are what make the businesses so strong and replicable in different markets. So you have to have a lot of things in place for your music school to be successful and study other people who have been successful in business. Um, there are several different models that can work and read the e-myth, the entrepreneur myth. Make sure you read that before you go too crazy. Yeah. Did you get a loan in order to start up or were you able to finance it yourself? Yeah, I, got, I had a $20,000 loan to start. Right, and so that got you the rent and the setup of the facility and that sort of thing? Yes, but I knew that if I taught, which I would probably do it differently, um, I would build in cutting back, scaling back right away. My students never quit, though, (laughs) so that's always hard. Um, I'm actually at that point right now where I I have a letter drafted that needs to go out, but it's it's hard. For me, it's hard. what, what was the letter about? Sorry, I missed what you were saying. Oh, I said I have, I actually have a letter. When I, If I could go back and do things over again, I would teach less going into it. I'm glad I okay. taught. And I well, several other studio owners who have done the same thing. They, they teach and then they phase out their, you know, their teaching and because they've hired other people. Um, I would build that in quicker than what I did. Are you winding the, back your own teaching in yes. order that you can give the time to the running of the business? Exactly. Because I knew going in that, okay, I can afford this rent if 
everything else falls apart and I'm left teaching. Um, it would be really expensive, but, but I could do this, you know, I'm not going to have to file bankruptcy. Mm-hmm. It's good. You've got contingencies are important. <laughs> um, I mean, they are important. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk, we, we mentioned at the start, we're giving away a freebie, which you've uh, created for us. Thank you very much for that uh, in regard to branding and a couple of different worksheets. So let's just dive a little bit into branding and, and why this is so important and why we often don't even think about it. Well, think of it as your value proposition. So why, what do you offer that makes you attractive to a large number of people and know yourself. So don't advertise yourself in one way and teach another way. Oh, well, I'm all about popular music and, and, you know, trying to be hip. And then really you're, you know, a core classical teacher, knowing who you are, knowing what your strengths are and figuring out what's unique about yourself and then putting it out there, I think is really important. Mm, Particularly in those highly competitive industries with the music schools that are charging tiny amounts, you know, the the only way to compete is by doing something uh, different. And so that's why I'm a big fan of uh, helping teachers with the popular music, as I know you are, or teaching composing, or maybe they become specialists in teenagers or uh-huh. Yeah, whatever it is that you're passionate about. I think you're so right, though. You've got to be, it's got to be real. You've got to be it passionate has to be. about that's, it. That's <laughs> don't, right. <laughs> don't advertise right. yourself as the most creative teacher if you're just taking your first steps into doing some improv with your students. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but that can come. You know, that, that's, yeah. that's a great thing to work towards. And perhaps if you're Absolutely. listening to this and you're in a, a really busy industry in your area and you, you know that you would like to become differentiated somehow take those first steps you know follow some of these ideas try out the pop recitals or whatever it is and see if you can start moving down that path Mm -hmm. i actually submitted an article uh to clavier companion that i hope they pick up and it's and it's a it's basically the path on how how to put on a pop a pop recital with and i have my students make chord charts it's so much fun it really is. Now, uh, the tricky part is a lot. I've been talking about this for 10 years. So a lot of people are starting to do it, which is great. So that's not really a great value proposition for me anymore. <laughs> so you have to be, you know, you have to be continually inventing yourself. So what works for two years, three years, five years, you need to be continually looking at it and saying, is this still working? What can I do better? What if I did this? How can, how can I change this so that it has more impact in this market? Things like that. Mm. And it's a lot of deep, slow work continuously, which I think is great. But if you build it, that doesn't mean they will come. That's true. Yeah. And you might need to pivot and, and take different directions. Right. But I think yep. the the point we're both making is that you need to work out what your point of difference is if mm-hmm. you're in a, in, a, in a town with 100 teachers. You've, you've got to set yourself apart somehow. That's right. Now, you, you run a large business now. Do you have some key kind of calculations or figures that teachers in their studio should be working with to make sure they're actually on top of what they're really earning? Because sometimes we, you know, we get this money in and other money goes out and I don't know if we often sit down and work it out. What, what should we be doing? Well, I would think I would, I would say that no, most teachers don't have any idea. I mean, they know kind of how much they bring in, but they don't know how much is is going out. Um, I use QuickBooks and I look at those reports on a, on a monthly basis, at least. And just looking at where expenses are going, you know, am I, is this, is this print expense worth it? Or can I accomplish the same thing digitally or in a different way? I don't have the magic answer to that. I think everybody's going to be a little bit different, but you have to know your revenue and you have to know your expenses. It's it's gross and it's net. Mm. Do you use many online automation style tools for workflows and processes? Yes. Have you got any that might be relevant to uh, independent teachers? Uh, Sign Up Genius is great. Jot Form is great for enrollment forms. Uh, we use Sign Up Genius for events and for summer lessons. So what does um, that do? Well, Sign Up Genius allows parent it puts the the ownership of signing their kids up for an event on them, not the teacher, and you know any any communication mishaps. It's it's on the parent. Oh, well, I signed up. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can have if there's a paid event. There's a great place they can't sign up until they pay. 
Um, if it's free, you don't even have to worry about it, but it's great. Uh, it makes things a lot easier when you're signing up for recitals and, and judged events and if it's a trip or if you have um, a recital and there's going to be like a potluck, you can ha- people can write what they're going to be sharing. Um, JotForm is great. We use that for our enrollment form. It's automated. We use Studio Helper for all of our new student enrollments and, uh, and invoicing. And those are my top three. Mm. And what would you say to teachers who are manually creating invoices putting it into an Excel spreadsheet, even if maybe they're not even doing that, but doing these there's things a, on paper. <laughs> there's a better way. There, yeah. Because because ultimately spend your time doing what 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 a computer can't do as well. So if a computer if a computer can do this better than you, then use your efforts in other places. Yeah. That's Cre- what I say. Create find those new students, learn That's new right. ideas. That's not- Spend 30 minutes on on my blog on on, <laughs> on, on YouTube, exactly <laughs> on growing, you know, yeah, or gardening, or however you get, you know, you free up space, you know, use that to your advantage rather than sitting there doing something that some some little formula somewhere else can do for literally for five dollars. <laughs> well said, well said. I, I use a lot of uh, automation tools uh, for my business, and it yeah, it makes all the difference. Yeah. I, you know, there's a big argument about credit cards. Well, I think credit cards are so awesome. And online payments. Oh, actually, that's another thing. Studio Helper is linked with either authorized.net or PayPal or both. And we just, money just comes in. You don't have to, you know, track people down. It's, it's great. I wrote a blog just a few weeks ago about how I changed to monthly automated recurring billing using software yeah. and uh, so I've written all about that check it out on the blog we'll put a show note note in these uh, show notes uh, it's actually so simple and as you say once it's set up the parents add their credit cards and all their details you don't even need to add them to the system and money comes in every month it's it's brilliant and I wish more people knew about it so that they could do it so I'm glad you added exactly. that exactly yeah exactly so you've mentioned one or a couple of your mistakes was there any other mistakes that you remember making that if you did all of this again, you would do differently? I would set up, uh, when, when I first started teaching, I was, you know, full-time, I was 26, five fish, somewhere in there. And I knew that I needed to keep everything, but <laughs> I mean, it was like the, the, my CPA was like, this is a typical shoebox return. <laughs> um, it's basically, I mean, you never want to, that's bad. You know, like, Oh my God. Well, that was the end of that. I'm like, I do not want to be one of these people again, but I had sort of folders and things outlined, but I didn't have anything set up in a way that was, you know, where I could automate it, where I could replicate it and turn it in. I mean, it was kind of a big to do when I turned it all in that first year. And I would say, have your financial house set up in order before you get busy, because once you get busy, you will never make time to do it. And so I had to pay a lot of money for somebody to, to organize it and to get, you know, get me right with the IRS. I wasn't, I wasn't ever, I wasn't in bad standing, (laughs) but, but in order for everything to be accurate, uh, he had to do quite a bit of work. Yeah. And so yeah. you use QuickBooks. Uh, I use Xero, X-E-R-O, uh, another option there. And there are plenty of, they're quite big software packages. There's plenty of smaller mm-hmm. ones. Uh, Fresh Books, I know is one. Yeah, there's lots. And, and Music Teachers Helper, My Music Staff, they all incorporate mm-hmm. billing and invoicing too. So do check out those options wherever you're at in your teaching and however many students you have, there's probably ways you can streamline what you're doing. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Kristen, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you again today. Thanks for coming on the podcast for a second time. Really great yeah. to hang out with you. Thank you for having me. So where can people find out more about you and your work? Well, um, kristenyost.com is my personal website. And then Center, British Spelling, Center for Musical Minds.org is my school. So we have Facebook page, a Facebook page, Instagram you know, all, all of the social media stuff. So I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, it's great. And, you know, check out, if you're interested in what uh, Kristen's been able to achieve, then check out her website because you can get lots of ideas by looking at other people, Thanks. what they're doing, videos, pictures, all that kind of stuff. That's right. That's right. Thank you again. We'll speak to you very soon. All right. Thank you, Tim. Bye-bye. Appreciate it. Bye.
Now, don't forget your free branding workshop download. It's available at timtoppencom slash episode 94. And you'll be able to grab the transcript as usual from the same page. Now, next week, look out for the start of Tech Month. It's a podcast all about building studio websites, where to find images, what pages you should have, what software you might need to download, everything to get you started. And we've got a great giveaway, which is a quick cheat sheet on studio photo release policies. Very important if you want to include any pictures of your kids on your website. So that's episode 95 coming up next week. Until then, have a great week. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.